Awesome. Hey, everybody, welcome to this live webinar. This is the Profitable Regeneration Summit or webinar. Um, if you're listening on the podcast or you're watching on YouTube uh, later, we, we welcome you. This is live. This is recorded. We're honored to have A.G. Smith here with us. And as we always like to do, um, we start these things with an invocation, with prayer. You know, we're, we're just the stewards here. God's the creator, and it's a privilege to be able to work among his uh, creations. And so we're going to ask Justin Morris if he would offer uh, a prayer on this, and then we'll jump in and get started. Okay, I'll, I'll do it as soon as the siren stops. Okay. <laughs> our Heavenly Father, we come before thee at this time to express our gratitude and appreciation for this opportunity that we have in this uh, Ag Steward webinar to learn about uh, thy creation and how we can steward it better. We're grateful uh, for the presentation which AG has prepared and and we pray that we may be able to have uh, our eye, our minds opened uh, to the principles and concepts which he's going to be sharing and his experiences, and that we might look for ways in which we can apply those on our individual operations. And uh, we, we pray for these things and thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to meet in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Justin. Um, these these are somewhat interactive, but because it's being recorded, we will just, uh, if you need to interject a question, just probably type it into the chat would be the best way. And then we will open it up for some question and answers, and I'll do a little wrap up at the end. Um, so jumping right in, A.G. Smith was gracious enough to um, take time out of his day to come and 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 more than that to prepare um to to give this presentation and so ag if you just kind of go down to the bottom and you hit that share screen <laughs> and go ahead and hopefully we can pull up your slides here yeah, um, so ag lives on the cottonwood ranch he's uh is it fourth generation third generation ag i'm fourth your fourth generation and you've got fifth and sixth generation on site right with your yes with your daughter and your, we do yeah and your kids so this okay is, now hit share do i hit share yep go ahead and hit share screen and then just select whatever application your slides are in if it's powerpoint just highlight that yeah there we are we got this there we are. Okay, and then if you want to, you can just go in, hit the present mode, and you can advance uh, probably either with your space bar or your forward arrow, um, just like you normally would in, in a live presentation. So um, so I've known AG for, oh, uh, 15 years or so, even though we're somewhat neighbors in Nevada, you know, we're 100 miles apart or so, but in Nevada, that's like a next door neighbor. Um, and I, I heard a lot about him. He was the founder and creator of what's called the Shoe Soul Group. Um, his, his approach is very unique and you'll learn about that. Uh, he attended a Savory Holistic Management class years ago. Um, and he realized that changes needed to happen on the range. But in order to do to do that, he needed to have the buy-in of the agency personnel and the community. And I know other people have done similar things, but I've never been able to witness it firsthand like AG has done, of being able to bring, um, in some cases, very much opposing forces to work together with the common goal of regenerating and restoring landscapes. And that what he's done ecologically is miraculous. But what he's been able to do as a leader in the community, I think, is equally, if not greater, a greater miracle of being able to unite um, people with a common cause. And and so I, you know, I am building this up. And I said he is legendary. Um, he's legendary because he's in some documentaries and in some books. Uh, Nicole Masters talks about the work that she did on his ranch in her book, um, The uh, Beaver Believers, I think. 
he's in that documentary. So there are there are things that are verifying that say, yeah, he actually knows what he's talking about. And, and firsthand, I've been on his operation, was actually up there this spring looking at what he's doing with virtual fencing. And it's it's just an amazing operation. And he's got a great family. Um, he's very much education oriented, doing classes and on-site learning. And so that's the other thing to plug into. Um, we can maybe touch on at the end some of the things that you can do on on the ranch. But with that, AG, we are just we're really honored and humbled to have you here with us and uh, um, learn some things in his bio that I didn't know about him. I didn't know he was a vet. I didn't know that he served in Vietnam uh, until I put that bio out in the email. And uh, that's we we appreciate and honor that. Is there anything else, AG, that maybe the your your bio didn't put in there something that either you're proud of or extremely embarrassed about, maybe your greatest failure. Sometimes that just kind of breaks the ice. Something that you want to share with this group that's unique about you. Are you there, AG? Nope. I He's think maybe muted. there we are. So I think you got to unmute there. I think I just asked you to unmute, but technology is wonderful. Again, everybody say a prayer that this will work because uh, this is going to be good. Okay. Let's see. So you're still you're still muted, Ag. Mute. There we are. There we are. Okay. Now we're good. Good Lord. Now we... <laughs> <laughs> we needed that. We needed that prayer. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. We do. We'll get. We'll get through this. So. So yeah. Well, I I I was starting to say I'm honored with what you just had to say. I um, that's very humbling. I, anyway, so thank you. Um, something that, uh, about me that people probably don't know. I, I have an affinity against shoes. I don't like wearing shoes. I, uh, I go barefoot a lot. There's not too many barefoot ranchers out there. So anyway, <laughs> and with that. That's great. That is great. I, I heard that actually from somebody who was at Nicole Masters class last, last year. I think they mentioned that you were, uh, running around digging holes with the tobacco barefoot and I thought good way. <laughs> <laughs> way to connect with the soil you know the modern, the modern guys they call that grounding maybe that's why you're it is it's grounding it's all modern shoes wreck our feet so anyway yeah well good well, that's, that's a whole that's a whole nother story well what a couple of things when when we to get started here one is that I end up doing a lot of the talking and and as you so graciously gave me an intro um this is a a, a work by a lot family and in employees and friends there's so many people that are involved in this thing to make this happen that um anyway i just sort of seem to be the mouthpiece for for a lot of them so anyway it's this is certainly not just me by a long ways. And, and then the second thing is, is I'd like to say that maybe uh, we had just a light bulb moment and um, that's what got us started down this path. But um, it really, it, we were, we were we, our backs were against the wall and we were really looking for something to help or some, a change to be made. Um, we were in terrible conflict with the agencies, both BLM and Forest. Um, we were blessed to have a lot of riparian areas, uh, riparian lengths of stream on our place. Um, but it, that was the riparians were becoming uh, uh, a high priority in the agencies, um, uh, so in their awareness and what they were wanting. Uh, range management to look at. It had always been sort of like riparian areas had been sort of sacrifice areas and uh, 
And of course, that is that is totally a wrong way to look at it. But anyway, um, so there. So what they were going to do is they were going to fence off all of our creeks, and they were going to cut the numbers uh, number of cattle that we could run. And uh, basically, it, they would have cut it down to where it wouldn't have been a viable cattle operation with those kind of numbers. So, so with that sort of as the background, Alan Savory came to uh, the Elko uh, Cowboy Poetry Gathering. And um, I didn't hear him, but several other ranchers did. And so the Wright family um, down at Mary's River, they brought classes to Elko. And, uh, and so they brought uh, Tommy Martin and uh, Steve Rich were um, HRM educators. And so they held two different classes in, in Elko. And actually my dad went to the first one and, and he called me and he says, you know, you might should take a look at this. We might should look at this. So anyway, I went to the second one. And uh, I had, I was almost getting to believe that maybe, uh, maybe I was in an industry that was harming the environment. Um, the, you know, the, what they showed and the cricks and the, and how they, their, their, uh, what their status was, was extremely poor. I'd watched our fishing go from being when I was really, when I was young, being really good to just being almost non-existent. And anyway, so things we did, de I definitely knew something was wrong, but you don't, you don't know what you don't know. It had always been this way. I, you know, I talked to dad, he said, well, it's always been this way since I came here. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of the damage and, and stuff got started clear back at the turn of the century when we had so many uh, cattle and sheep in the country. And, and there, there was a tremendous amount of overgrazing at that time. And, uh, and then they had some really tough winters. And I think that really uh, uh, started a lot of the damage that we're still dealing with today. But anyway, so once I, when we went to that class and all of a sudden the instructors are, uh, Tommy's saying, you know, your cattle, livestock can be used to rehabilitate the land. And that was a huge turning point for me because knowing of course that livestock can, uh, are definitely users, can be abusers, but now, but the whole concept of having them be rehabilitators of the land was a foreign was totally foreign to me but it was exciting and uh it gave me i didn't i didn't want to leave this business i i mean i i love ranching but it gave me hope that they we could do this and and make a positive difference so that's what started us down the road so um okay i see we've got a we've got a picture here <laughs> okay, so just give me a cube, AG, or just tell me to bump to the next one. Okay, you're in control now, huh? Yeah, I am. I am in control. So if you if you want to follow along on yours, and just every time you advance, I just tell me, hey, go to the next one. That it's not ideal, but we can make it work. No, no, that'll work. That'll work. Okay, so what, what, what? So through the years, we we we. Of course, entered into this hoping and wanting to have to improve the the conditions and the environment and the range. Um, I I never truly thought I never thought we could get where where we're at on these cricks, especially. Um, it has just been uh, amazing how they've changed with just changing your management and paying attention, paying a little more attention to what's going on out there. And we certainly didn't do it right to begin with. I mean, uh, one of the things that Tommy Martin said right off the bat is that these people are, you're going to have to give, give them total flexibility and you're going to have to let them run a lot more numbers if, to make this work. And, uh, and then from our standpoint, we were committing to put a rider, or a rider out there with these animals and manage them a lot more intensely. Um, 
they we went to the B, the BLM and Forest Service. They we it, it's sort of like at the right time, the right people come together. And uh, we had um, Wave Stagger was the Forest Service uh, uh, Ranger, and um, Helen Hankins was the BLM director. And both of those ladies. Uh, wanted to see something different, wanted to see something work. And they went out way out on a limb to make this happen. And uh, they did a joint EA. And anyway, they, within just a few months, they got, they had all of the paperwork in place to, to go forward. So in that, that was in 95. So our first year we got started was in 96. Um, we, we had jumped, we jumped the herd up to about 800 that year. And it, I, I, I knew that herding was going to be a challenge, but not knowing, I hadn't done any, gone to Bud Williams or anything yet. And wow, what a challenge. You know, I thought I knew how to handle cattle, but I, all I did, I knew how to beat on cattle is what I, I did. And it, it's, it's been a learning curve. It's been a learning uh situation since then to try to uh, to try to get this herding thing going but anyway so really what we did when it first started it ended up being a cowboy and his dog riding up down the creeks and making sure that those cows didn't sit on the creek and and get them out there where they weren't uh, uh, where they hadn't grazed getting farther away from the riparian so and even with that even with that it started making a difference uh, and so and well, we'll get, let's go. Okay, so here, here's where, this is what right around the ranch, what it looks like. This is, the ranch goes from about um, 5,000 feet at the lowest end up to almost 10,000 feet at the top end. So you just seen the lower end. This is the top end of, of where these cattle run. Okay. Uh, this is just an example of the riparian areas this is on the mountain, uh, not down on the BLM, but they're, you know, they're typical narrow, uh, narrow little areas that doesn't take long to be overgrazed, um, to hit the, the marks that they have for utilization. So anyway, okay. Uh, okay, this is what my, this, when mom and dad first moved on to the place, there was this log cabin, okay this barn and uh and this we went to a one-room school down at the gibbs ranch okay so here so here is this is tommy martin and um what we did she passed away uh, a little over a year ago and uh, i truly this i owe this woman uh, us being still in the ranching business she changed our uh, our way. Uh, she changed the way we were thinking, and she changed and she uh, she she just taught us a lot. So, um, but anyway, what we did when we first started this is uh, she's a people person. I mean, she was she was a rancher and all of that, but she knew the value of bringing people together and getting buy-in from everyone to make something happen. And so, one of the things we did when we first started is we. Um, sent out a notice for anybody that was interested in helping manage this piece of land to come to this, come to the ranch. And she did a, a short two day uh, HRM uh, fast class, whatever. But anyway, that this was the beginning of our team, which we still have and the beginning of, of, of the project. Okay. So the I cannot reiterate the value of the team and getting people around the table and talking and and talking about what we have in common rather than what we the differences we have and um, I would never go back to the old way of doing business. This is this has been it takes time but it's been extremely rewarding and. Um, so enter on um, the left, my left anyway, 
this is Goat Creek. This is this is a little intermittent stream that uh, this is after the fire had gone through by a couple of years. Okay, next. This is that same Goat Creek um, early on in 69. I just threw this in there. Okay, next. This is a team uh, over at Goat Creek. Um, so some of you will know Camp Mac, New Camp McAdoo. He's in the middle there. This we call this Kent spot. He always wanted us to take a picture whenever we we met. You can, if you sit there right now, and I've got to retake that picture. You wouldn't even be able to see anybody. The willows are are, are so thick in there. Okay. Um, this is a map of the place. Um, the private down there. We're surrounded by um, our BLM, and then. Uh, towards the left up there with the FSs, that's our Forest Service allotments. So, okay. So here, this is no, no, go back one. Can you go back? Okay. So this is the, this map. Some of these divisions are fence divisions. Some of them, after the fire, we put in electric fence. So some of them are divided by fences, but a lot of them are just divisions nat with natural barriers. And we use it for, for our management purposes. We keep track of when we're in these different areas and uh, at what time and, and, and numbers and all that. So, okay, next. And this, is, this corresponds with uh, uh, the pastures here and the timing over here. And it, it, a way to keep track of where we've been so that we, we really don't want to go back to the same area uh, at the same time uh, in consecutive years. We try to always be in another place um, the next year. Okay. Okay, go ahead. All right, so this is um, in, in 19, so this is, this is, a, this is a B, actually a BLM photograph. But in 1973, this is on the main fork of Cottonwood Creek. Um, we, we're right here, we're, run, we're running probably um, four, 450 head of cows, but they're there for three months of the year in this, in this area. Uh, okay. I want the key that, that, um, that sagebrush is with the arrow on it, it's sort of keep track of it. So, I, so here is a 2009 and in the, bought what right over the, right past the 2009 is that sagebrush again. Okay. Here's 2014. The sagebrush would be farther to, it'd be on the other side of the creek from on the left-hand side, but the still see the fence there. Okay, here's 2015 and there's that sagebrush. Um, okay, so there's there that, the, that just right there, and I know there are different times of the year, which makes a, a big difference, but you can tell that the, in 73, the creek was quite wide and, and scoured, and now it's, it's getting to be a lot more armored with willow and, and sedges and narrowing up. So in the 73 picture, that's with uh, less numbers for a long period of time. On the right side in the 215, this is running 800 plus animals for two weeks, uh, very rarely more than three weeks, but, or three weeks, very rarely three weeks, mostly two weeks. Okay. Uh, same spot, but we're gonna look downstream. So you can sort of see that fence line. So this, the sage, we're right, right in the same area as we were taken upstream, so, okay. Uh, Again, here's 2005. You can see that fence line still, okay. 2009, that sagebrush is in the, in the right-hand corner. Um, so 2015, okay. So the, again, um, the difference, this one shows it a lot more how the riparian vegetation has come in and that, so. Um, okay, fire comes to the basin. All right, in 2000, 
we had um, we had a fire. We a lightning strike hit out on Camp Creek, and we had a fire that burned across the place. It burned about a third of our range, um, and we fire was something really new for us. It, it, it was sort of those early years where it was sort of new for a lot of people, but. Um, we had never, the O'Neill had never burnt as far as dad could remember. And in fact, dad above the ranch, he, he tried to start, start fires. He wanted to burn that big tall sagebrush and he never could get it to go. Well, so we were, I was really sort of thinking, well, maybe the O'Neill doesn't burn. Maybe we're, well, that's wrong. It burns. And, uh, and it did a good job of burning that year. Okay. So, so we had the 2000 fire down in the BLM and bottom of the forest. And then in 2008, we had a, the forest burnt up on top. This was on the top of our allotment. Uh, this was mostly a timber fire. Next. Okay. Uh, 96, the, this is Go Creek Flat in 96. Um, this is the year that we started with HRM. Okay. This is 2000. This is what it looked like uh, after the fire. Um, and I'd never, I'd never seen, hold, yeah, hold. I had never been around fire, so I'd never seen that. And I looked at that and went, my God, how is, how can, how can this come back? Well, it has come back amazingly well. This is, I've got to get a new picture because now it's the it, so much more sage and bitter brush and that have come back in. It really is. Um, it's it's really looking good. We, the leks that burned up are are back now. The sage grouse have re re reestablished two leks out there. And um, anyway, it's doing good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Should I give you a thumbs up? I'll do a thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, get ourselves coordinated here. All right. This is a riparian area up on the forest, on our forest service. Um, again, this it's it's a tough area. Down below, there's a fence down below. It's the only water in this area, the ed edge of the forest. And there's a road and a camping spot that right through here. So it, it, it's got a lot of uses right in here, but it always has looked this way from the time I can remember. And, um, and this is with basically three months, season long grazing, three and a half months on the forest with, uh, with only a couple hundred head up there. So, all right, next. Next. <laughs> uh, so 98, um, 98, we had just started HRM. Now we're, here's 99. Sort of pay attention to this, this, uh, this big tree back there as we go along with this. Things are starting to happen a little bit. Um, all right, 2000 hits and it burns down. All, all the quake, everything just burned. Those are all standing, but they're just dead standing. So, did you have okay. to remove livestock for a period of time after the fire, Ag? Yes. Yeah. Go to the next one, and I'll explain that. Okay. Yeah. Next. Um, so we had to be we had to stay off the forest for two years, um, two full years, uh, and you know it actually that. That was a good thing. We need the forest. The, the forest needed it. Needed that rest, and so, uh, and we were able to. Um, it, we ended up using our private a lot more during those those times. So, we also went to some winter range, which I'd never done before, and that was good for us. So, uh, the big tree with the arrow is now dead, but um, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, here is uh, 2009. Okay, so when we when we first start when we started into this and we had the riders and we were we were managing the cattle more, the BLM is a lot easier country and um, it was working it was starting it was working really well down on the BLM. 
but the Forest Service was not working. It was, it's really steep country, uh, real hard to really herd animals and, and uh, little narrow riparians. And so things, things were not, imp and we were using it still during the hot season of use during the year. And so things were not improving like we wanted to see up there. And actually uh, the a forest range con says, why don't we get out of the box and, um, and let's, use, let's use part of this forest really late where we have, it's cut in half so we can use, we, we do have a, the option to use one side or the other different. And so what we did is we started using half of the forest really late. And I'm, when I say late, I mean like October and having the snow, we'd go up in October and we'd have the snow would bring them off. And the other half we would use during uh, the hot season time of year. And then we'd switch that around back and forth. And of course, put, we'd put rest in this, in the whole program at different times too. So, um, and that, that there, that was the trick that started changing it. And as you can see, the quite, you know, in those early pictures, um, there was the willow and the grass, but the little quakies weren't coming back. There was all the old quakies, but there wasn't a lot of young quakies and those cows would just keep them eating down. So, but now, um, it, you can, this, 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 the, the, Quakies, the willow, the sedges, things are, the things are really, really are changing. Okay. So 1996 to uh, 2014, and it's gotten, it's just continued to get better since then. Um, 96, that would be season long, hot season long grazing with a couple hundred head. Uh, the other picture is um, 800 head or so in there again, two weeks or a sh lot shorter time, a lot more animals, a lot shorter time. So again, it's not, it's not the numbers, it's the time and timing that, that, that is the key to all of this. We, and, and, and we, we, we really, Tommy, I can remember Tommy's talking about strays are the bane of, of having good range management. Those, those few that stay that you don't get out of the country uh, can just set back everything that you had worked on. And, and we saw that in those early years on the forest. Very hard to get all of the cattle off the forest um, because of the, the terrain. So there was always these stragglers that were still up there. And, and they basically just, even if we had went out with most of the cattle and the riparians were in pretty good shape, um, those few stragglers would just take it down to the nubbins. So... Um, I experienced that firsthand, and and not that we can gather better now than than we are, but by using it totally different, and letting the snow brings the cattle out in the late season and in the early season, uh, we don't always get them all out, but we get mo most of them. But it's it's working. It, you know, you just you gotta you sort of gotta work these things to what your operation is works for your operation you know and so um on the forest we herding isn't i mean we watch the cattle and 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 keep them in different areas but it's not the big deal that it is on the on the blm and yet just by changing the timing of that of that uh, of being up there it 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 worked that's working for us there so it isn't one thing what works in one place might not work in another i guess that's what i'm trying to say um, okay, these are, these are a couple, this is a BLM photo points um, on, on the cricks up there. Uh, Pat Coffin, who was the, wait just a minute, Joe, you're getting ahead of, <laughs> Pat okay. Coffin, who was uh, the uh, fish biologist for, he was, he had a career in uh, Endow and then Fish and Wildlife, and then and he ended his career in the BLM. And he gave me, when he left, when he retired, he gave me this big binder of all of the pictures and everything that he'd ever taken on the ranch. So we've got all of these really valuable old pictures. I've just got one or two sites in here, but there's, 
there's like uh, 15 different sites that we have pitched uh, that have a series of pictures for. So, okay, so this, go ahead. Again, same spot, um, 88, okay. Uh, we have just, we've started uh, HM by now, but as you can see, the things aren't changing on the cricks very much yet. Okay. All right, so now we jump clear to 2011. And I know this is, this is the same stretch, but the other pitchers were back upstream farther, but when she couldn't get back upstream and take the picture at, of the site because there was, the vegetation was so thick. So, uh, but it is the same site. Um, okay, so this is, this is the, the actual um, surveys through the years of how they how they came out, and as you can see, uh, go go to the next one, Jared. So takes this middle ones out. So in '79 over here, you can see that all of them pretty much were poor. There was a couple of fairs, but most all of it was in really bad shape, basically. So in 2011, you can come over here and see their excellence and goods. I think, I don't think we even have any fair anymore. It's all either in the excellent or good. There's been a 62% increase in riparian health um, in these years, and it's gotten better. It's gotten better. They haven't, they haven't read their plots since 2011, but um, the, the riparians are, the beaver is another story, and we'll talk about that as we go along here. So, uh, this is just a picture of the of the, you know, people have asked if we keep them like sheep in the out there, and and the answer to that is no. But we do keep them. You know, they they stay a little more bunched than scattered clear across the range. So, next, we run horses as well as cow, as cows, so we have multi species. Okay. Um, lots of, after the fire, we put in a lot of electric fence um, so that we could graze part of it and then rest the other part for the two years that they wanted. Um, and we've kept those fences in as tools for um, managing the cattle in it. And it helps in keeping from having to be riders and that. But our next goal as is now we're working with putting collars on cattle and having virtual fences. And we hope to take out all those electric fences as we go along. So this is my daughter. Her and her husband manage this place. I just do what they tell me to do nowadays. And uh, anyway, they're, they, they're, they're gonna take this place, they are taking this place to the next level. So anyway, I put this one, this was sort of funny. This is. We run at the very north end of our forest, we run in common with uh, Mike Gary's sheep operation. And uh, we ended up all in this one little basin together with the cows and the sheep. And uh, they, were, uh, they, were, they were grazing together. They were laying under in the shade together. And so my, my theory is that it really isn't sheep and cattle that don't get along. It's uh, cowboys and sheep herders. So it's a people thing. <laughs> All right, beavers. Okay. So beavers have always been in our in the system, but it's been sort of a love-hate relationship. Um, that the beavers would build the dams and and when have you been through? Yeah, they have, Tony. Uh, so um where was I? Okay, so the beaver, what started happening is we started noticing about 10 years into it that, um, all, that the beaver dams were holding, they weren't washing out like they used to. And, and it wasn't, this wasn't a planned thing, but as, that, as those riparians got healthier, it allowed those beavers to make tie their dams to really um, secure um, uh, 
riparian vegetation that would, rather than tying it to just dirt or sagebrush or whatever in the past. And, um, and they, they started staying. And the, one of the, re what used to happen is they, the bee were always there, they'd build their dam, but the riparians were in such terrible condition, their dams all, they were built and tied into basically just dirt banks and, and with sagebrush and the spring runoff comes, which we get big spring runoffs here. Spring runoff had come and it had just washed around the beaver dam and take all of that sediment and wash it downstream and it would go in to the meadows and fill up the ditches with, uh, with sediment. Dad, Dad got to where he was building with a little cat. He'd build this great big sand trap before the water came onto our meadows and it would fill up every year. He'd fill that we'd have to dig that out every year for it. So, okay, next. Uh, okay, again, you know, this 98 was, this is the same site um, and the beavers have come in and, and again, this is, this isn't this, this, the riparian vegetation and stuff hasn't started taking over there yet, but okay, next. Uh, again, they, they're able to tie their, their dams, they've got huge dams now and they're, they, you know, like here, they, they've tied them to willow to willow and there's sedges and all the things that hold the riparian together there. And that dam's been there for, I don't know how many years now and hasn't washed out where it used to be. These dams would wash out every year practically. So next. Again, just tying, being able to tie it to good vegetation. Next. Uh, this is that dam. This is that dam that it showed it. I mean, they've cre they're creating wetlands up there that are just, it, it is truly amazing. Keep in mind all of this water. These pictures were all taken at the same time and I'll, I'll explain what I'm meaning here in a little bit, but. Okay, so here is an example of uh, a, beaver, a beaver dam that will wash out in the spring. It won't, the reason it won't, uh, it isn't washed out on this one is because this is off a of spring. So it doesn't have that spring runoff on it. So, but see it's on the edges are tied to just sagebrush dirt banks and uh, very unstable. And so anyway, next. That's what, curious, just what happened to the beaver when they got washed out in the spring, AG? Um, well, they, I, they all, <laughs> they, they, they always rebuilt again. They, they, they didn't leave. They never, we've okay. always, Though beaver populations go up and down, they're very, very cyclic. We've, even even when things are really good, they're cyclic. But um, but they were all they've always been here. They've always been here. Yeah. So we had uh, 17, 2017 in the high water year, um, we lost beaver, and we still are waiting for them to come back. Um, really, they left. They or they, whatever. Yeah. yeah whatever. Oh, um, and so they're, we're just starting to see them entering back into the, to that area. So just curious. So they, that, that's good to hear that they didn't like drown. Yeah, they didn't. I, I, we have more beaver now than we did because it's healthier for them. There's no denying, but um, yeah, but they, 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 we've always had them. So uh, just, this is that same dam and, and the riparian stuff, vegetation and stuff is starting to come in even on those. And so beaver dams, you can sort of see the little willows are growing. That thing is totally a willow uh, beaver dam now. So next. Again, they're raising the, ta the water table. Um, they've, they've, they've just created these, these, these high water, these backed up this water all over the place. Okay, next. And what's happened is above the ranch, we, we have that really tall, big sage sagebrush trees you can drive 500 head of cows into that area and um, come out with five on the other end and not know where any of them went so um, so this is they don't uh, sagebrush doesn't like wet feet and so without raising that water table a lot of this brush is is dying out and we don't want all of it to leave this is tremendous sage grouse brooding area they they don't nest in here, but boy, they raise their little ones in this, this stuff. So, but what's happening is it's turning back to meadow where those, 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 uh, those big sage brushes are dying out and stuff. It, 
and it what used to be metal. I mean, you can tell that the ground was a, was a metal one time, and it's and it's it's amazing how fast it's turning back to metal now. It's just really so. All those pictures of water was was during a really really drought year, really dry year, and that was the amount of water that was running in Cottonwood Creek by the rant by the krells. So if we hadn't had all of those beaver dams and all of that, we would have been in a world of hurt up on the on the ranges for for water and, and drinking water. And I'm sure we wouldn't have any water down here by then. Okay. Yeah, so drought and the water the water storage with those beavers is it's just amazing. It truly is amazing. But they are they are such industrious little guys. If you could just get them tackled the way you wanted them, but always, but <laughs> okay. So um, on to our private. Um, this is a picture from the hill down across our meadows and, 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 and we have two, what we call the north side, which is the side closest to us and the south side. And uh, the north side is, is somewhat newer ground. When dad moved onto the place, it was all sagebrush and he actually moved some water rights over to it and, and took it and put it under production. So it hasn't, so it's somewhat newer production. Um, he, was, he was able to put head gates and things. So he had a lot better water control on this side. The south side is the original meadows that have been flood irrigated for a hundred plus years. And, um, and it, the whole system over there was so, uh, well, when I was a kid, it was just manure dams and rock, and then it became rock dams. And but it wasn't head gate; it wasn't dams that you can control the water. It was once the water goes on, went on, you left it on, and when when the water started going down, you took it off and you hate it. So um, so it was constantly wet, constantly underwater. Um, <clears throat> So here's another lady, <laughs> Nicole Masters, that has changed our lives too. She is absolutely an amazing soil scientist and an amazing person too. She's from New Zealand and we've been lucky enough and blessed enough that she, um, she, she I went to actually when I first, I, I saw her with uh, Dave Pratt's Ranching for Profit and asked her if she'd come out to the ranch and do a class. And she said she would love to. So she wanted to do something in the Great Basin. So uh, anyway, so oh, wait a minute. So, so this is a, this where we're standing is on the north side and the other side is the south, is the south side. This, this south side, um, well, let's go. Okay, next. This is the south side. So what? I've, I've, we, we've, we've known, we, we've, we've been trying to think of a, what we needed to do on that south side. We've asked lots of people. Uh, of course, the first thing that comes out of everybody, expert's mouth is, well, you just need to fertilize it. Well, and we, we experimented with little fertilizer and it, it didn't really make, it made a little difference, but it really didn't make that big a difference. And we didn't want to get on the fertilizer uh, merry-go-round that, that, that's out there. So, um, so Nicole says, well, have you ever, have you dug any pits? And, and I said, well, mm, no, soil pit, huh? I hadn't thought of that. So, so anyway, so Nicole, we got the back out and we dug some soil pits. And this, this is her class that she, this is the class that she had um, that first year she came. So, okay, so now, there's going to be a better picture. So this is this is the soil pit on the south side, and so the bottom end there is water. There's the soil, and and there's a mat on top. Let's go to another next. There's a better picture. We can, okay, this sees it. You can see this much better. Um, so we actually had had that mat there. The south side with all of the way the water regime had been for years had created just this sod bound mat of vegetation. A lot of it was wire grass and sedges and anyway, junkas. We'd, we'd turned it into a, 
um, a riparian area in a way, but not with the really good riparian grasses. But anyway, um, and then, so when we dug this pit, and I mean, we're irrigating out in different places out here. So um, there's this dry, there's this ground, and then there's water. And these plants up here are not even putting roots down to go down and get that water. They're relying totally on the water that we put on the ground. And so years ago, dad said, when we talked about water was one of our issues, but he said, when I take water off, it, it, it doesn't grow. And he was right. I, I, I tried it several times. So, so these plants that we had absolutely needed to be in water, that's where they were getting their vegetation or their nutrients and everything, but yet water was the problem of why, why we had created this, this, uh, this mat and this. Uh, when I, I was, um, I was out uh, aerating this before Nicole, this was before Nicole. And when I got to the end of the roll that I was doing, I had one of those big roller things. And anyway, I turned and the whole, it was like a rug on a hardwood floor this around the tractor and all of that, it all just moved and that whole top four inches of dirt, of dirt just came with it. Um, and that's sort of when I went, hmm, we do have a problem here. Okay, okay, next. Uh, you can get, see a little bit better, uh, this, the water, the, the dry dirt and the, and the grass on top, so, okay. Again, we were this, we were, we, if you, when you irrigated out there, the, it didn't, this is, this ditch is on one of our irrigation ditches. And if you didn't get that water out and onto that ground, that it just would burn up. It would not, there was no sponge effect. There was no nothing that to, um, that should be. Okay, next. Yeah, okay, so the, what it, 24 minutes to get one inch of water infiltration, 80% um, unpalatable plants and 80% non-rhizome, zonomous, zonomal. Very, we, we, the, we have leached basically all the nutrients out of the soil. It was, um, yeah, anyway. Okay, so, um, so, so this is the beginning of what we of, of the change that we made to uh, get control. We had to get control of the water, and we tried looking at some different uh, flood irrigation ways to do it, and it just none of it seemed to be feasible or cost effective. So um, anyway, this is north side and south side. Um, again, top picture. So. The bottom picture shows the pivots now that we have on the south side over there. Okay, next picture. Oh, okay, this is, okay, so this is the north side. We dug the pit over there. Next. Nicole loved this. She calls them Rastafarian roots. And she, the soil was deep, the roots were long, uh, very productive. Um, anyway, next. These roots went off, you know, really long roots that went way down deep soil. And of course that, and it is, it's definitely a different soil regime. This soil on the north side is really, really very good and deep. The south side has more gravel and different things in it. And I had a lot of people say, you're never gonna get the south side to look like the north side. Well, let's keep going here. Um, again, Nicole just, sitting in the dirt she liked. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, the infiltration, one minute, two inches of water. Um, wow. um, only 5% impalatable species. Okay. Uh, the humus, and the, it was just, it, it does need a few things. It needs more variety in, in the plants we have there and some stuff, so we're working on it. The other thing that we're, we've noticed is that we've been feed, because it's handy the way the hay's been, we've done, been feeding on this a lot. And we're now creating another problem where we're, we're getting a, it's not being able to break that feed down, all that hay down. So anyway, we've got, 
we've become aware of that. So we've got to, ch we're, we're changing what we're doing there so we don't, so we can keep our land healthy. All right, so the south side, this is, this is what we had to do to break up that, uh, that map so we could get something else growing in there. And they, they just, it wasn't a big plow thing, it was a ripper and it just ripped that top, that top area up. And so we ended up, you, you could hardly walk out across this. And um, we were going, how in the hell are we ever gonna seed this? But anyway, okay, next. Again, just, that's the thing that ripped it. Go ahead, next, next. So the, this, so the rip that we, we, we ripped it. And then we had a outfit come in with this cedar from Belgium. It was the dangest thing. And it actually took these, um, the, all of these, all these clumps and things and it actually pressed them down and then it seeded. Next. Hmm. And you can see that, you can see that line. You can see how it pressed it down here on, the right and and it hadn't it hadn't been seated on the left. Okay, next. Putting the pivots in. Next. This ground averaged uh, about three quarters of the ton to the acre on the south side before we started doing what we were doing. So we seeded. This is a uh, uh, cover crop. It's got radishes. Uh, other forages, we had some grasses in there, some clover. Um, anyway, the radishes were amazing. They were radishes to break up the ground. So next. Wow. <laughs> that is a radish that was out, <laughs> out in that field. It was full of these huge radishes that just, and the Anyway, so it put it broke up the soil and it put a lot of organics back in the soil because cows didn't eat that. Okay, so here's the south side. Um, wow. This is uh, we we went for this year. They just finished taking the hay off from it this year. This pivot, the first pivot, uh, did just under three tons to the acre, and the other pivot did about a ton and a half to the acre. Um, I, again, I never would have dreamed we could have got, and it, it took, I mean, this is the fourth year. The first two years, not much happened. A lot, and, and a lot of weeds. There was a lot of weeds in the first two years, but we kept putting in uh, a cover crop with it. Um, this, this uh, a lot of grass here is triticale. Um, with, uh, back, back, Jared. Um, we are, we belong, we, we have, we're, we're on that sage grouse credit uh, program. And so they come out and monitor different spots on the private every year since we've been on that. And so Jerry and I were out in the middle of these pivots doing a monitoring thing. And when he first started way before we were doing all of this, there was two, gra there was two grasses mainly. It was a Junkus and a, and a Douglas uh, sedge and, that, that was about it. There's really no wildlife value or anything in that site. This year when we measured that, there was five different grasses um, and six different forbs that are in there. So there's, um, there's brome, there's, there's uh, orchard grass, there's, uh, of course we have garrison meadow foxtail. We have a lot of that, That's, we didn't plant that, but um, Anyway, there was, it's just an amazing variety there now. And there's a little herd of antelope that live on those pivots all summer now where they used, they, there was never any, any wildlife down there. As soon as the sage grouse will not, don't like it until it gets cut or grazed. And once it gets cut and gra or grazed, then they move in. And uh, there's lots and lots of sage grouse. So um, this is just taken taking the hay. This, <laughs> this is my grandson in the back, and he actually is driving that truck. He was, he's 10 years old, and he drove that truck to the top of the hill. And it, anyway, I, when I first saw that, I'm going, oh, really? But that's great. That parents, that's, I'm, a, I'm just a grandparent, so <laughs> I worry more. <laughs> uh, next. 
Okay, this is this is something that Tommy Martin really stressed in all of her work that I did with her. So it's called the Gibb Triangle, and it's and it's how it's how organizations, families, you name it, ranches, the, the, how they it it describes how a way to um, but to run how it should run. So in this one, you got trust and you got acceptance and trust on the very bottom. You've got communication, you have goals, and you have control on the top. When your trust and acceptance is so low that 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 it it becomes what they want what people want to do then is they want to put more control on it because nobody's trusting or accepting the, what the other people are going are doing. Okay, next. So if you have a lot, if uh, if you have a good base of trust and acceptance and the communication and the goals, you don't need much. You don't need control. Um, and in in our in this uh, the the shoe soul resource management group, our our collaborative, we <clears throat> we you see that we we trust each other. Um, we enjoy going to these meetings. We. They're not always, I mean, there's some big issues that have gone through, but um, anyway, next. Oh, too many, too far. Let me see if I can back up here. I think I skipped. Okay, is that where we're at? Yep, yeah, this is just the team in, in our one of our meetings in Wells, so. Next. Maybe just describe like who is represented there briefly, AG. Um, oh, besides, okay. Besides I belong, we actually, I, we have two collaboratives that we belong to. Um, one is the shoe soul, our shoe soul, which is sort of like our intimate little collaborative. And it's, it's us, Boyces and U-Hearts. It's three ranches that we come together. And then there's a bigger one that I belong to and it's called Sane. Um, all the basically all the same people go to the to to the same one. So over here you've got uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife, you've got the Nevada Forestry. Um, in the background is a um, the person that does sort of the weed stuff for us, uh, fish fish biologist, several ranchers. Um, Jerry is part of the CD program and. Uh, um, um, what am I and this the sage grouse credit system? Uh, there's BLM, uh, another Nevada wildlife, a BLM uh, wildlife person. There's the weeds lady for the BLM. There's NRCS, uh, there's Department of Agriculture, and there's Fish and Wildlife Service there. Yeah, so, yeah, it's I really like this. Um, this we know, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. This we know. All things are connected like the blood which unites one family. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. And that's it. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for that, AG, that's wonderful. Um, so I know Stan had a question, um, what are you doing to mitigate kind of that thatch and when you're feeding hay, feeding heavily on the, um, wherever you might be feeding, you know, how are you, how are you yeah, helping that into the soil? And it, it's because, the, I don't want to say lazy because that isn't really it, but those were close places to the hay. Um, in the winter time, it's hard to get break new ground and things, but we're we are not going to be feeding on that ground now for for a while. It's got plenty of so we're we've actually changed where the hay is stacked now so that we can get out into other areas. We it's just a realization that you've got to you got to distribute the hay. That you're feeding over all of the acres too, and uh, 
that's that we were just con confining it to too few of acres. We were using those closer places to feed just because it was convenient. And now, you know, sometimes you just need to get kicked in the ass and go, okay, we've got to take a look at this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. You spread that fertility to other acres and that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, and we wanted to do it. It just, you, you, you know, you get sort of tied up in, in all the, all the things that life does and you run out and feed the cows and come back and anyway. <laughs> yeah. So we're more now we're aware of what, what we caught, what we could be causing out there. So. That's great. Um, yeah. Very good. Just looking. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the accolades here in the comments. Um, it was very helpful. This was something that uh, I feel was very timely and how, um, if, if anybody has a comment, you can either type it in the chat. Sorry, I wasn't able to see the chat when I was doing the presentation. So hopefully I didn't miss anybody, but, um, uh, or you can just raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you and unmute you and we'll, we'll go here for a few minutes and then I'll kind of tie things together. And then if any of you brave souls want to stay on, we can go after the recording has stopped and answer some additional questions, but, um, I, I saw a question from Tony. Yeah. Uh, about we haven't we haven't tried stockpiling or feeding uh, feeding the bales, but we're 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 talking about it. We're looking at it. I'm right in the middle of reading your book right now. I highly recommend this book to anyone. It is a great read. You've done a great job. Yep, it is a good one. So Tony, it was. Uh, Green Grass in the Spring by Tony Malmberg. Just for those who are listening to the recording, and Tony Malmberg is on. He's been one of our previous guests. So if you go to either the YouTube channel, um, the Profitable Ag Steward is the YouTube channel, or look for uh, the Profitable Steward podcast, you can go back. And he was one of our first speakers, actually, on this series. And so um, did a great job and highly recommend his book. Yeah, um, I I could relate to so many things in that book. It was amazing. It's amazing. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. What were the effects of weeds in the first couple of years? Um, kind of there were so many that. weeds. In, and, and, I, and when I say weeds, we didn't have any really bad noxious weeds. We don't really, knock on wood, we don't really have a noxious weed problem out here. But um, there, were, there, was, there was so many weeds that, and I rem I was walking out across it with James Rogers, who was the manager of the wine cup for a while and great person. And, um, and I was saying, James, this is, is all we're growing is weeds. And he goes, just give it some time. It'll change. And it, it did the, the, the good grass. Well, and we, and we keep putting the cover crops in and they, they, they basically have now weeds aren't a problem. So yeah. Yeah. You've been able to speed up succession and help it. Yeah, yeah. Help them move and forward. we're, you know, and this ground isn't where we want it yet by a long ways. It's extremely deficient in calcium, really, really bad. We've been putting calcium on it now for three years and, um, and, and some other things that we put, we're still doing the thing, some of the things that Nicole has recommended. She gave us a, um, um, with our latest soil samples, she gave us a what she thought we should put on this year, and we did. And so, um, anyway, it's still it's still not where we want it. Are you yelling at somebody? <laughs> yeah, I had to mute to do that so I could yell at my kids to turn the TV down. <laughs> um, yeah, that's. Uh, Coincidentally, so we are working with, is it Cody Spencer that was going to do the class? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're lining him up for a subsequent webinar. Uh, he had to make sure it was okay with Nicole. But basically to give the presentation that he was going to give at the Cottonwood of kind of that uh -huh. version of your journey from the soil health perspective. Because I think, um, I know that we have land on our ranch that looks just the same. Like we have to pour water on it. As soon as the water comes off, it dries out. There's shallow roots, but there's sedges. There's water loving grasses there. Um, and it's kind of gravelly. So it does dry out really fast. So it, 
I think looking around the state and probably around the West, there's a lot of people that can relate to that. And so I, 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 yeah, I'm sure there's just a lot of these really old flood irrigated meadows that have been flooded forever and, and they're, and they just aren't very productive anymore. Yeah. Yep. It's like you can't, uh, yeah, you, you need the water to irrigate them, but at the same time, it's, uh, and Tony has some good stories about how he's been able to restore some of those as well. So, um, somebody said, Cody is, Cody will be really good. He, he came last year with Nicole's create class or whatever. And, and, um, he's, and he's, he's going to, we have a, we have an outside person that, uh, does our monitoring Roland Cruz from who's a HM educator and he's trying he's going to retire and Cody's going to take over that so we we're pretty sure that that's going to happen so great great guy yeah he's going to be he's anyway um so yeah Justin we'll uh we'll ask AG to share his contact information if you're okay with that AG just to absolutely yeah yeah Probably an email. You can tell, and you can tell, you can tell I am so tech savvy that <laughs> make sure, no. make sure it's simple, whatever you, whatever you ask. <laughs> What's a good email address for you, AG? Okay, it's AG Smith, and that's spelled A-G-E-E, -E, and then Smith, 51, at gmail.com. And I'll let you all guess what 51 stands for. Yeah. <laughs> getting, getting up there. <laughs> hey, that's all right. You're just getting seasoned. Um, Dan asks, and Dan, if you want to unmute and give some clarification, then we'll go to Tony's question. But um, speak to the Gibbs Triangle. Is there something specifically, Dan, that you would like a specific question around that? Well, I just... <clears throat> On every ranch, you have uh, a group of people who spend all their time together. And we all know that we tend to take, I don't know, exception with the people who are closest to us. So how do you keep that communication open over the generations? Wow. Um, that, that is, that's the hundred thousand dollar question um we've we were we we really work at trying to to meet fairly regular um we've had lots of really steep bad hard family issues that have that have that are still uh, have never been really resolved not really in my immediate family but in a little the 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 next layer out there so um but i've noticed that you get busy in the summer and uh we don't meet and pretty soon the communication isn't happening and people aren't knowing what the next one's doing and mckenzie and i just talked about that and um, anyway we had a we had a meeting to get together um we went up not too long ago and nicole and and um and uh, I'm forgetting her name from Montana. They they're they're doing a sort of a not intervention but counseling for communication. Um, so so we we went and worked with them right before Christmas, and that helped. That helped. Uh, yeah, you just have to. Uh, Dave Pratt has been here and worked with the family. We've had. Numerous people come and, and we learn something and it gets and it just, it's one of those things that you really have to stay on top of. It's it's easier to do all these other things than it is to keep this communication going and and everybody um, talking to each other and not letting those little things grow into these huge things that can just blow up and everybody goes, well, what the hell happened anyway? So um, I wish I had a really good answer, Dan. <laughs> no, thanks. thanks for your honesty. I appreciate that. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you, Dan. Tony, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, so on that south side, you got to over 
two tons production in year like four or five. Did you use any nitrogen fertilizer then? We used what it needs. It needed, you know, it needs nitrogen too in the thing. So what we did, Nicole, uh, we put in a. It's a, it's a slow release nitrogen, so that it, uh, so it didn't just burn go, the nitrogen to go in there and just burn up the organics and everything. Um, so this, it was a, this is what Nicole recommended. So yeah, we did put that on there. Yeah, and hopefully with uh, Cody, we can speak to that a little more, more of the kind of the recipe of like how it went from where it was to where it is. And, and you know, and our goal, <clears throat> our goal is to not, is to have it be healthy and so self-sustaining so we don't have to keep putting amendments and things on it. So, and grazing is going to be an absolute, grazing is a part, going to be a part of this. This isn't just all production for hay underneath that so we're, we're well already this year, of course we've had such a great year this year but it after we've taken that hay off in there and that one pivots it's a foot high, higher so we're gonna we're gonna be able to go in and do some good grazing on on these two so yeah pretty impressive have you um have you been able to quantify the increased production on your rangeland due to improved riparians and um have you seen, have you seen no ums or certainly there's an increase in feed but um has that been reflected by the agencies increasing your AUMs or are you just able to stockpile more feed rest it it, it isn't it hasn't well there's a couple of things that have gone so we were we had when we first started into this and we did the ea and and the, got the flexibility and all of that then 10 years into it or so the blm um wanted to put this into the permit and make this the permanent permit to do holistic resource management and they their permit has total flexibility on the blm and how they took care how we were going to handle the numbers is on temporary non-renewable AUMs so that every year we could get the, those, they would be, they'd come out, we'd discuss it and we'd have, we'd have those of those AUMs available. Well, it didn't take, and that, and that worked really well for the first three or four years. And uh, then Western Watersheds got onto that they, that it had to go out to the public. So they appealed those. And so by the time it went through the system, the season's over. So they basically were able to shut that down and we haven't, we're, yeah, that's one, two, we're, we're really working at redoing our permits, both the BLM's pretty good, but the forest service is, is really bad now. They, they pulled out of the, the MOU and all of the, the agreements we want because Western watersheds sued them and for every, and, Every um, every permit that was not that was out of the original boundaries or the original permit, um, the they the, what the the people, powers to be the judge or whatever said everybody's got to pull got to be back into the old permit, which is un, uh, it's hot season of use, uh, very reduced numbers. Um, it's we're we're working on. So we're working on that. It is a, it's a challenge I think any of us in the deal with the agencies can relate to. Do you have, Tony asked, do you have any suspended AUMs? Or are they all active? No, we, no, we don't have any suspended AUMs to use. Yeah. I, I, well, I don't, I, I think we're going to, I think on the BLM, we're going to, it's going to, with some of the new things that are happening, I think we're going to be able to get that TNR of something like the TNR back on the BLM, uh, the Forest Service. I'm not sure what the we're going to have to rewrite the permit, and we're going to do that. But we want to put the ran the whole ranch got put into an experimental status when we first started this. Everybody got done with the class and went, "Wow, that sounds good." Do you suppose it'll work here? Being from Missouri, everybody, 
And so our backs were against the wall and we really didn't have a lot to lose. And we said, hey, we'll put the ranch up as an experiment to make to, to see if this does work. So that's how we started. So the whole permit was an experimental status. And um, and we want to put it, we want on the Forest Service, where it seems to make sense that we could put it back into experimental status on these call on all this collars and the virtual fence because it's us and BLM and uh, the, uh, Paul Myman with the Extension University of Nevada Extension. He's he's the lead on all of this. So it's an uh, fish and wildlife have got mo uh, money in the in the pot. I mean, there's just again a group of people that came together to make this this experiment go, and so we're they're they're the powers that be are looking at it right now. So. I've got my fingers crossed that would go into experimental status. If not, and I don't know how this will work or not, but we're gonna we're 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 gonna we're gonna go up the ladder and tell the story and see if we can get somebody to pay attention. I don't know. Yeah, and that's com it is a compelling story, and that's uh, the world that we live in, AG. And you know, I think storytellers are the ones who have the power, and so that. I know that having the credibility that you have, um, I think that you, I think that story needs to be told and it can be told. And if any of you young people feel compelled to help him through marketing, I think that's a big part of it. Being it able is. to get social media, YouTube, and make, make your voice heard. Um, and just like you, and you know, well, like what you're doing, I, I'm so non, I don't know how to do all of this, but just doing this podcast, doing these things, it's so, I mean, you reach so many people, you can reach so many people these days. If, anyway, yeah, we're yeah. working on, we're working on, I've got some good people who are helping us, helping me too, so. It, That's great. It'll be interesting. That is, that is great. Um, so. Yeah, just kind of tie things together and and tell those who are new here to Ag Steward. This is something that we do. Uh, we do it twice a month, the second and fourth Thursdays. We try to have this caliber speaker on, um, somebody who can speak to those of us in the regenerative agriculture community who are passionate about stewardship and land regeneration, and ideally doing that with livestock. And uh, so look for these. We do them at four o'clock, second and fourth Thursdays of the month. Um, my short little message for this group is this. Uh, has anybody ever told you to simmer down? <laughs> I think. I don't that, hear it too often anymore. But <laughs> so I was thinking about that this morning, like that, that thought, simmer down. And I thought, you know, maybe we need to look at this. We need to turn this thing on its head. So bear with me here for just a minute. And this is my own, this is my own summation right now. And probably you can hear it from AG. Maybe some of you can relate. There's a lot of things that are pressuring me and my family right now. So we've got a girl that's going off to college. We're finding her housing. We actually decided to buy a home in Virginia. We don't live in Virginia. Holy and cow. <laughs> we're going to buy her a home in Virginia. That's going to cash flow and it's going to help pay for her housing instead of it being a sunk cost um financially uh this is the profitable regeneration webinar but in all candidness we're not rolling in the dough like we we have taken a path where we believe that the ranch needs to stand on its own and so we're not subsidizing it with unpaid labor or other subsidies and it's hard it is really hard to be profitable even though we're at extremely high cattle prices our main enterprise is custom grazing. So as everybody knows, we've seen a 30% inflation to most of our inputs, but our custom grazing rates haven't reflected that. So things are tight. Um, have some relationship challenges incorporating that next generation into our business. And thinking about that, and I'm a prayerful guy, and I think this kind of came through inspiration, but what I felt God telling me was, my natural tendency was to back away and say, okay, we're trying to do too much. I've got to back down. I got to turn down the heat. I got to simmer down because the pressure is too high. And what I felt was the heat is good, Jared. One, it's refining you. We know that if you go dip water out of the Creek, 
one of the best ways to kill the impurities is to boil it. So maybe we're being boiled a little bit right now. Maybe we're getting some of those impurities cleaned out of us. Number two, if things get into a rolling boil, it tends to kind of those impurities rise to the surface. They make them easier to skim off and see, and we can get them out. Our, we're, in what we do, we take a holistic approach from a human side. We look at, you know, we've got a brain, we've got a mind, we've got a, a spirit, we've got a body. And a lot of times our, our spirit is saying our soul, that, that spark inside of us is saying, go do this. But yet our body is fearful. Like you've been hurt before, you better just back off. And your mind saying, oh yeah, remember last time when you did this and you failed. And so we're going to back down from that very thing, which is the breakthrough to get us to that next level. And so my message is, Maybe rather than simmering down, maybe we need to turn up the heat. Maybe we need to be okay with the pressure and realize that those things that come to the surface, meaning in this, it could be the negative thought patterns, those negative emotions of maybe fear or regret or doubt that come to the surface. Maybe those are the very things that God and the universe and our fellow man are trying to help us to realize that if we just change those, reset our programming, like we can progress further and faster. So hopefully that resonated with somebody. That's what I felt inspired to say. Don't simmer down, turn up the heat. If you need help turning up the heat um, as a coach, I can help you with that. Uh, that sounds scary though, right? Um, but, uh, in a loving way right in a loving way and being able to recognize okay where are those negative patterns what is what is it that's stopping you what is the where is the wall and uh absolutely stay in the fight don't back down like we we know i think we can draw back on that assurance at some point in our lives we've probably had a conviction that this is our path and if you haven't do some soul searching and make sure this is the path and I think maybe bring to bring this kind of full circle, AG, I'm sure there's probably times when you felt like quitting. What was it that kept you going, facing some extreme opposition, either enter internally, externally? What was it for you that's helped you to stay in the fight? That's a dandy question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, And you can, it, there is, there is something that is more than just the profit and all of that in, in these ranches and in the lifestyle. Um, it's like it gets inside of you and it's, it's just, I can't, um, I can't imagine I can't imagine living any, doing anything else to tell you the truth. And, um, and, and, and one of the things as we went along is that, damn it, it doesn't have to be non-profitable. You don't have to be poor and be a rancher. So that was, and, and, and for my end, for our end of it, we were going, we can gray, we, if we do this right, we can graze, we can graze adequate animals to, to, to be profitable and improve the resource as we do it. It can work together. And, 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 and of course the challenge is, is with the, the agencies in that and getting them to, to see that. Um, the other thing that it, failure, we, as a society, we, we look down on failure. You know, we, if, if somebody's, Got, got bankruptcy or any number of things that we we tend we tend to say oh they're a fa they're a failure well that's the only way you learn is by i mean one of the only ways you learn is by failing and by ma making mistakes and then taking a look and try not to make them again and but i've heard it many times that there's more to be learned in a mistake or a failure than there is in and having everything go right. So um, anyway, um, I don't know Very if that well. answered. 
<laughs> yeah, that that is that is great, and we appreciate your candidness. And you know, it's it's been a journey. By no means have you arrived. No, nope. don't know. That. And that's I think was what is part of that learning journey. Um, and it is a journey. It's you know when I I when we first started into this, I thought I I knew this ranch. You know, hell, I've been raised on it, and I I do pretty much know where everything's at, but. Man, when you start getting down on your hands and knees and looking at the, the bugs and what's under the soil and how everything affects everything, all of a sudden I realized I didn't know anything about this ranch. And it's been just an amazing learning experience that, that's, that's ongoing, um, learning about it, it and, every, and other things. So That's wonderful. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap it up. If anybody wants to stay on for another few minutes with AG, we can do that. But uh, we'll go ahead and end the recording. Thank you, AG, for being part of this group. Um, if you just search for Cottonwood Ranch in Nevada, um, or the I put his I put his uh, email address also in the chat. We really appreciate you, AG, being part of this, taking time out, and uh, we, I I know that everybody here has been blessed by your presence, being willing to share your story. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And it, um, you can, uh, we have a website too, Cottonwood Guest Ranch. You can, it has some of the things on it. So too, but I appreciate it. Actually, I really, I was very apprehensive. And uh, when the technology didn't go to, if I was going, oh, sh shit. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's great. And I'm going to be part of what you got going here. Yeah. That, that's wonderful. So yeah, be sure if you're listening to this, check out you know, be the prior podcast and we're going to keep doing this in the foreseeable future and is spreading the spreading the message of regeneration.